Some questions you may have heard posed about Anne Boleyn over the years include Did Anne Boleyn have six fingers? Did Anne Boleyn seduce Henry VIII with sorcery? Did Anne Boleyn miscarry a deformed fetus? In short, was Anne Boleyn a witch and is that why she was executed? Well, keep listening, fellow history lovers, because all the answers are coming up. Now, I'm going to start by saying that I don't think Queen Anne Boleyn, second wife of Henry VIII and mother of Elizabeth I, was a witch. Not just for all the reasons I'm going to talk you through in this video, but because I don't think witches are real and even if, for the sake of argument, we say that they are, I still wouldn't think that Anne was one because a genuine witch with superpowers presumably wouldn't have let herself be executed. So this video isn't about proving the veracity of the witch claims made against her, but rather a discussion about whether or not these claims were actually made during her lifetime, and if they contributed to her date with the headsman at the Tower of London on the 19th of May, 1536. The idea that Anne was believed to be a witch by her contemporaries is a popular story that you'll hear repeated from time to time, and it is rooted in four pieces of evidence, in inverted commas, which were commonly viewed as indications of witchcraft in 16th century England. These were 1. That Anne had a sixth finger upon one of her hands. 2. That she had other warts and moles on her body which would have been seen as marks of the devil and which she attempted to hide with her clothing. 3. That she miscarried a deformed fetus in January 1536. And 4. That Henry accused her outright of having seduced him with sorcery. I'm going to examine each of these in turn, explaining the origins of the stories to you, as well as telling you what was found when Anne's skeleton was disinterred from under the floor of the Chapel of St. Peter at Vincula in 1876. Before I do that though, I'm going to nuke what I think is the most common misconception with regards to this former queen and witchcraft, and that is the inaccurate belief that she was accused and found guilty of being a witch at her trial. She was not. Anne was accused of imagining the king's death and of adultery with five men, including incest, with her brother George. These are the charges upon which she was convicted and sentenced to death, and witchcraft never came into it. Now let's turn to the stories of her supposed sixth finger and the warts and moles. I'm going to deal with them together, as the sources which describe one often describe the other, so it's not practical to try to separate them out. Having an extra finger is a real medical condition called polydactyly, but there are no sources written during Anne's lifetime which mention her as having had it, and the only near contemporary painting we have of her which shows her hands shows only five fingers on each, although admittedly the edge of her right hand is not displayed. None of the portraits most commonly believed to be her show any warts or moles, though we might argue that a tactful painter would omit them. The story of these supposed deformities, because that's how they would have been viewed at the time, rests largely, though not completely, on a report made in a book published in 1585 entitled De Origin ac Progressu Schismatis Anglicani, meaning The Rise and Growth of the Anglican Schism which was written by a man named Nicholas Sander, sometimes called Sanders, who described Anne as follows. Anne Boleyn was rather tall of stature, with black hair and an oval face of a sallow complexion, as if troubled with jaundice. She had a projecting tooth under the upper lip and on her right hand six fingers. There was a large wen under her chin and therefore to hide its ugliness she wore a high dress covering her throat. In this, she was followed by the ladies of the court, who also wore high dresses, having before been in the habit of leaving their necks and the upper portions of their bodies uncovered. She was handsome to look at, with a pretty mouth. This is the only outright claim that she had six fingers, and it's also the source for many of the rumours about her supposed other physical defects. But as I hope you can see, this report has all sorts of problems. Some aspects of it are correct. She did have dark hair, an oval face, and what we would now call an olive complexion, suggesting that perhaps Sander saw a portrait of her or read a legitimate description. 
However, his account is cursed by internal contradictions and errors, describing an almost cartoonish character beset by flaws, yet still somehow handsome to look at with a pretty mouth, notwithstanding the projecting tooth and sallow skin, of course. The statement that Anne wore high-necked dresses and set off a craze for them is also wrong, as even a cursory glance at portraits of the women at Henry VIII's court shows. Low, square-cut necklines were all the rage, and we see Anne wearing them too, including in the one contemporary image we have of her, which is this portrait medal from 1534. A closer look at Sander himself raises further doubts regarding his reliability. Nicholas Sander was born in England in about 1530, making him a child of around six when Anne was executed. He didn't know her himself and therefore couldn't draw upon his own knowledge and memories when describing her. He was also a Catholic recusant who left the country in around 1560 after refusing to sign the Oath of Supremacy to Anne's Protestant daughter, Queen Elizabeth I. Thereafter, he lived on the continent and was a vocal critic of Protestantism and one of the many who plotted to overthrow Elizabeth, who he referred to as a she-tyrant. All of these problems could, of course, be traced back to Anne. She was the mother of Elizabeth and the woman for whom Henry VIII had abandoned his first wife, the Catholic Spanish princess Catherine of Aragon, and broken with the church in Rome. There can be little doubt that Sander harboured a deep-seated hatred for Anne and her daughter, and it undermines everything he says about them. Other slanders he threw at the former Mistress Boleyn included that she was sent to France at the age of 15 as a punishment for improper behaviour with her father's chaplain and butler, but this is demonstrably false. In actual fact, she went to the court of Archduchess Margaret of Austria in Mechelen, which is in modern-day Belgium, when she was about 13, then to France, and neither was a punishment. Instead, it was a great honour to serve Margaret, then Mary Tudor, Henry VIII's sister, not his daughter, during her brief stint as Queen of France, then her successor, Queen Claude. We even have a letter from Margaret to Anne's father praising the girl and thanking him for sending her to the Archduchess. But what of the other evidence regarding Anne's witchy looks? The only other near-contemporary source which hints at an issue with one of her hands comes from George Wyatt. George was the grandson of the poet Thomas Wyatt, who was a contemporary of Anne's and who some historians believe was in love with her. Whether this is true or not, he was certainly one of the men accused of committing adultery with her and was locked up in the Tower of London at the same time as her in 1536. Unlike Anne, though, Thomas was ultimately released and lived on until 1542. His grandson George was not born until 11 years later in 1553, and his own father, the poet's son, died when George was a baby. However, from George's own account, it appears that family stories were passed down to him, either verbally or in family papers, as he lists two women as his sources. One was an unnamed lady, who he says was a lady of noble birth, living in those times, and well acquainted with the persons that most this concerneth, from whom I am myself descended. This is why I'm sure he had family information. The other may be identified as Anne's lady-in-waiting, Anne Gainsford, Lady Zouche. Such a chain of evidence isn't watertight, we're still relying on memory and hearsay recalled decades after the events in question, but it gives him a greater air of credibility than Sander. Presumably on the authority of these sources, in 1605 George Wyatt wrote of Anne that There was found indeed, upon the side of her nail, upon one of her fingers, some little shoe of a nail, which yet was so small by the report of those that have seen her, as the workmaster seemed to leave it an occasion of greater grace to her hand, which with the tip of one of her other fingers might be, and was, usually by her hidden without any least blemish to it. Likewise, there were said to be upon some parts of her body certain moles incident to the clearest complexions. Anne's biographers have picked up on this description, and Eric Ives thinks it is plausible that there was a small defect near the top of one of her fingers, which Anne was apparently self-conscious about based on what Wyatt has just said and made an effort to conceal, but the written record does not allow any greater conjecture than that. As for her warts and moles, 
It sounds like she had nothing more than a perfectly normal sprinkling of freckles which could be found on anyone. There was one person who apparently saw her though, because remember Sander and George Wyatt didn't, and who criticised her looks, and it's their report which we'll study next. Before I get to that though, if you're enjoying this content and would like more from History Calling, please hit that subscribe button and switch on the notification bell. This is completely free and it will ensure that YouTube lets you know every time I upload. You can also find me on Instagram as well as on Patreon, where I provide bonus material every week, including things like early access to ad-free videos, mini podcasts and blog posts. Both sites are linked below for you. Thank you to all my pre-existing patrons, as well as to those of you who make one-off donations to the YouTube channel using the thanks button underneath videos. These extra sources of income really do make a difference to me and help me to make this a full-time job, so I'm always very grateful for your generosity. And now, back to that report about Anne Boleyn's appearance. In a hostile account sent to the court at Brussels at the time of Anne's coronation in June 1533, an anonymous writer said that a wart disfigured her very much. She wore a violet velvet mantle with a high ruff, gulgiel, of gold thread and pearls, which concealed a swelling she has resembling a goiter, which is a swelling of the thyroid gland. As Eric Ives has pointed out though, Anne wore the coronation surcoat required for the occasion, which, if it was like her daughter's, as seen here in a much later portrait of Elizabeth, did indeed have a high neck. It wasn't to conceal anything on her skin though, and even if she was a little swollen and puffy, let's cut her some slack. She was six months pregnant after all. I can't tell you if she had a wart, but one person's wart is another's beauty mark, and George Wyatt did concede that she had certain moles incident to the clearest complexions, so it's possible one of these was on her face. If she did have anything as devastating as a goiter and a witchy wart, it's certainly curious that her other detractors failed to mention it during her lifetime. The Imperial Ambassador, Eustace Chapuy, saw Anne on many occasions and pretty much loathed her for displacing Catherine of Aragon and for her treatment of Princess Mary. Yet not even he mentions her as having had an extra finger or displaying any signs of being a witch nor were any such problems mentioned at her trial. This is despite the fact that this would have been an extraordinarily damning insult to be able to throw at her. In an era when superstitions, magic and witchcraft were still very much believed in and there was no understanding of genetics, any perceived physical defect was taken as a sign of the work of the devil or of that person's inherent wickedness. The idea that Henry VIII would fall in love with and marry a woman who had such obvious flaws, in inverted commas, is preposterous. While it's true Anne was not considered a great beauty, there is no hint in contemporary accounts of anything as serious as a sixth finger, and tales of her warts seem to be seriously exaggerated. Furthermore, when she was disinterred in 1876 and her bones examined, no extra digit was located, though admittedly not all her bones were there, either because they had disintegrated or because they had been taken as souvenirs by those who had dug her up previously. Yes, that's right, and had been disinterred at least once before in 1750. See my video linked on screen and below all about the Victorian excavation to learn more. Let's move on to the next piece of evidence, sometimes cited in support of the witch theory. This is the story that when Anne had a miscarriage in late January 1536, either the 29th or the 30th, when she was about 15 weeks pregnant, that the child was deformed. Again, this tale can be traced back to Sander, writing from exile 50 years later, with no direct connection to Anne and no source to support his claim that, quote, she brought forth only a shapeless mass of flesh. This story has been given new legs in the 21st century by the likes of the TV show The Tudors and by the historical fiction writer Philippa Gregory, who created this exchange for the birth scene in her 2001 book The Other Boleyn Girl, which is told from the point of view of Anne's sister Mary. The midwife receiving it into her hands gave a sudden exclamation. What is it? Anne gasped, her face red from straining, the sweat pouring down her neck. It's a monster, the woman said. A monster. 
Anne hissed with fear, and I found myself shrinking from the bed with superstitious terror. In the midwife's hands was a baby horribly malformed, with a spine flayed open and a huge head, twice as large as the spindly little body. Anne gave a hoarse scream and clambered away from it, scrambling like a frightened cat to the top of the bed, leaving a trail of blood over the sheets and pillows. She shrank back against the bedposts, her hands outstretched as if she would push it away. "'Wrap it up!' I exclaimed. "'Take it away!' The midwife looked at Anne, her face very grave. "'What did you do to get this on you?' "'I did nothing, nothing. "'This is not a child from a man. "'This is a child from a devil. "'I did nothing.' The implication in this passage is clear. Anne's child is malformed and has been born dead because she's been involved in black magic. It's a child from the devil, not from a man. Now this is a completely fabricated conversation written for a fiction book. However, unfortunately, I find that many people mistake Miss Gregory's work on the Wars of the Roses and the Tudors for actual history, and so it doesn't surprise me that the story of a malformed baby continues to be popular. If Sander had had more imagination, I don't doubt that he would have written something similar. Of course, with Anne long dead and unable to defend herself against this onslaught of lurid stories, it's much harder to combat them. But it's not impossible. To counter the accusation of a shapeless mass of flesh and the links to witchcraft which such a pregnancy would have implied, we have other sources – all contemporary or much closer to it than Sander. Chronicler Edward Hall recorded the loss of, quote, a child before her time which was born dead, while the courtier and Windsor Herald Charles Risley stated that, three days before Candlemas, Queen Anne was brought abed and delivered of a man-child, as it was said afore her time. French poet and diplomat Lancelot de Carle said she lost a beautiful son before her time, and Chapuis recorded that on the day of Catherine of Aragon's funeral, Anne lost a baby, quote, which seemed to be a male child which she had not borne three and a half months, at which the king has shown great distress. Moving forwards in time, John Stowe, who collected together the old chronicles of England and published them in 1580, reported that the 9 and 20th of January, Queen Anne was delivered of a child before her time, which was born dead. Finally, George Wyatt said that she was delivered early of a dead boy, quote, with much peril of her life and to her greater and most extreme grief. No one mentions anything unusual about the baby, only that it arrived long before its due date and that its parents were heartbroken at the loss. Just as with all the supposed marks of a witch she was meant to bear, a deformed fetus would have made for the ideal piece of ammunition to throw at Anne just a few months later when she fell from favour, yet it was never mentioned at her trial. Nor did it come up during the reign of her stepdaughter, Mary I, who hated her and would no doubt have been delighted to have such a juicy piece of gossip to law at her, even posthumously. Instead, we need to see this for what it is. Another part of Sander's vendetta against Anne, which has been perpetuated by screenwriters and novelists. Finally, let's consider one of the most damning pieces of evidence in favour of Anne being accused of witchcraft during her lifetime. Henry VIII's apparent accusation that she had used sorcery to make him fall in love with her. This was reported by Chapuis, who wrote to his employer, Emperor Charles V, on the 29th of January, 1536, that... This very morning, someone coming from the lady mentioned in my letter of the 21st of November, Ultimo, and also from her husband, has stated that both had heard, from the lips of one of the principal courtiers, that this king had said to one of them, in great secrecy and as if in confession, that he had been seduced and forced into this second marriage by means of sortilages and charms, and that, owing to that, he held it as null. God, he said, had well shown his displeasure at it by denying him male children. He therefore considered that he could take a third wife, which he said he wished much to do. Let's deal with the insane chain of evidence first, before I discuss the phrase sortilages and charms. Between Chapuis and Henry, there are three, if not four, intermediaries telling and retelling this story, and that's assuming that this conversation ever even happened in the first place. 
The ambassador is saying that Henry told one of his principal courtiers that he had been tricked into marriage with Anne. Either this courtier or another one then passed the information on to an unnamed lady and her husband, who told one of the lady's friends, who told Chapuis, who's now telling the emperor. It's bonkers. There were so many opportunities for the message to get garbled here that it's hard to believe the king ever said any such thing. Even Chapuis, who was always up for a bit of Anne bashing, found the story hard to swallow, telling his master that, This intelligence, though coming from sufficiently authentic quarters, seems to me almost incredible. As for who the lady and her husband were, I don't know. Chapuis said he'd mentioned them in a letter to the emperor back in November, but when I looked at his letters from that day, no source was named. Now let's deal with the key phrase in this report, sortilages and charms. Sortilages is an archaic word which the Oxford English Dictionary defines as the practice of casting lots in order to decide something or to forecast the future. Divination based on this procedure or performed in some other way. Sorcery, magic, witchcraft. So Henry would indeed appear to be saying that the marriage was the result of magic, though he doesn't explicitly state that it was Anne who was the spellcaster. Even if he said this though, and I can't emphasise enough how weak the chain of evidence is here, please remember even Chapuis doubted the veracity of this tale, but even if the king said it, it doesn't mean he actually thought it was true. I'm sure I don't need to tell you that when people are angry, stressed out, disappointed or frustrated, sometimes they say things they don't mean. If Henry had genuinely thought that he'd married a witch and had a child by her, it would have come up at the trial, for it would have exonerated him of all blame for the messy situation in which his marital exploits had landed him. It also would have been an easier way to get out of the marriage than having to pretend he'd been cuckolded by a cheating wife, and it would have negated the need to accuse other men of committing adultery with her and kill them too. The timing is also all wrong. Chapuis wrote this letter on the day that Anne miscarried, or possibly the day before, but that means any comment by Henry must have been made before that, while she was still pregnant and everything looked rosy for the couple once more, with the longed-for heir hopefully on his way. It was hardly the time for the king to be spreading tales that his marriage was the product of black magic. What I will concede, though, is the fact that this story was obviously doing the rounds at court in 1536, whether Henry said it or not but it obviously never gained much of a foothold, as this is the only mention we ever hear of it. So gang, that's the roster of evidence used to support claims that Anne Boleyn was accused of witchcraft and my analysis of it. I hope you've enjoyed this look at some of the most sensationalist stories made up about this controversial queen. Let me know in the comments below if you think the witchcraft accusations were around during her lifetime, and if you want to learn about another royal lady who definitely did face such charges during her life, watch my video on Jaquetta of Luxembourg next. I'll be back next week with a new offering for you, and until then, keep learning.